Hey folks, welcome to today's episode of the Law of Self-Defense show. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Today, we're going to do a reading of a recent decision out of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. This is out of Texas, essentially, and it's a Second Amendment decision. Now, of course, in the federal system, we have really three levels of courts. We have district courts, which are the trial courts. We have the circuit courts, which are the mid-level court of appeals. And then ultimately, we have the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a court of appeals decision, again, out of the Fifth Circuit. And the key issue in this case is whether or not a federal statute that bars an individual from possessing firearms if they're an unlawful user of a controlled substance is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I'll be doing a straight-through reading of this case. Uh, the judges here are Jeffrey Smith, uh, Justice Higginson, and Justice Willett. Uh, my only regret about this decision is that Smith, it is a unanimous decision, by the way, three to nothing, Federal appellate courts are three judge panels. Three to nothing decision written by Judge Smith uh, and with a concurrence written by Judge Higginson. Judge Willett, unfortunately, didn't appear to have written uh, any substantive contribution to this decision. He fo voted in favor of, with the majority, of course. As I say, it was a unanimous decision. Um, but that's regrettable because Judge Willett is a wonderful legal writer. Um, so any of his decisions are well worth reading. Unfortunately, he does not appear to have made a substantive contribution to this one. Spoiler, this decision, three to zero, Court of Appeals, Fifth Circuit, found that the federal law that bars an individual from possessing a firearm if they're an unlawful user of a controlled substance is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. Before I jump into the rest, I do, of course, want to mention the sponsor of today's show, which is none other than Law of Self-Defense. You can get a copy of our best-selling book, The Law of Self-Defense Principles, for free from us. Now, I do urge you to check it out on Amazon. You'll see it has over 1,500 reviews, I believe, five-star rated. But don't buy the book on Amazon. They'll charge you $25 for the book, plus shipping and handling. We'll give you the book for free. We only ask that you cover the cost of shipping the book to you. You can get your own actual physical copy. It's not just some PDF download. Copy of this book for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. And with that out of the way, let's dive into this decision out of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, United States versus Patrick Darnell Daniels Jr. filed on August 9th. 2023, so only a few days ago. Argued before Smith, Higginson, and Willett, the circuit judges, on this decision, and the majority decision is written by Judge Jerry E. Smith. He writes, Title 18 U.S.C. Section 922 G3 bars an individual from possessing a firearm if he is an unlawful user of a controlled substance. Patrick Daniels is one such unlawful user. He admitted to smoking marijuana multiple days per month. But the government presented no evidence that he was intoxicated at the time of arrest, nor did it identify when he last had used marijuana. Still, based on his confession to regular usage, a jury convicted Daniels of violating Section 922 G3. The question is whether Daniels' conviction violates his right to bear arms. The answer depends on whether Section 922 G3 is consistent with our nation's highest tradition of firearm regulation per New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, the 2022 U.S. Supreme Court decision. It is a close and deeply challenging question. Throughout American history, laws have regulated the combination of guns and intoxicating substances, but at no point in the 18th or 19th century did the government disarm individuals who used drugs or alcohol at one time, 
from possessing guns at another. A few states banned carrying a weapon while actively under the influence, but those statutes did not emerge until well after the Civil War. Section 922 G3, the first federal law of its kind, was not enacted until 1968, nearly two centuries after the Second Amendment was adopted. In short, our history and tradition may support some limits on an intoxicated person's right to carry a weapon, but it does not justify disarming a sober citizen based exclusively on his past drug usage. Nor do more generalized traditions of disarming dangerous persons support this restriction on nonviolent drug users. As applied to Daniels, then, Section 922 G3 violates the Second Amendment. We reverse the judgment of conviction and render a dismissal of the indictment. In April 2022, two law enforcement officers pulled Daniels over for driving without a license plate. One of the officers, an agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, approached the vehicle and recognized the smell of marijuana. He searched the cabin and found several marijuana cigarette butts in the ashtray. In addition to the drugs, the officers found two loaded firearms, a 9mm pistol and a semi-automatic rifle. Daniels was taken into custody and transported to the local DEA office. At no point that night did the DEA administer a drug test or ask Daniels whether he was under the influence, nor did the officers note or testify that he appeared intoxicated. But after Daniels was Mirandized at the station, he admitted that he had smoked marijuana since high school and was still a regular user. When asked how often he smoked, he confirmed that he used marijuana approximately 14 days out of a month. Based on his admission, Daniels was charged with violating 18 U.S.C. Section 922 G3, which makes it illegal for any person who is an unlawful user of or addicted to any controlled substance to possess any firearm. An unlawful user is someone who uses illegal drugs regularly and in some temporal proximity to the gun possession. While Daniels was under indictment, the Supreme Court decided Bruin. It clarified that firearms regulations are unconstitutional unless they are firmly rooted in our nation's history and tradition of gun regulation. Daniels immediately moved to dismiss the indictment, claiming that Section 922 G3 is unconstitutional under that new standard. The district court denied the motion. It expressed some doubt that Daniels was part of the people whom the Second Amendment protects, as Daniels was not a law-abiding, responsible citizen. Nevertheless, assuming that Daniels had a right to bear arms, the court found that Section 922 G3 was a long-standing gun regulation. It compared Section 922 G3 to laws disarming felons and the mentally ill that Heller called presumptively lawful. Congress passed Section 922 G3 in 1968, only after many states had similarly banned habitual drug users from possessing guns. The district court placed great weight on that regulatory tradition. It engaged with few historical sources from the founding or Reconstruction, but it relied on statements from other courts, notably all predating Bruin, that Section 922 G3 was supported by the historical practice of disarming those who exhibit a dangerous lack of self-control. A jury found Daniels guilty. He was sentenced to nearly four years in prison and three years of supervised release. By nature of a Section 922 G3 felony, Daniels is also barred for life from possessing a firearm. See 18 U.S.C. 922 G1. Daniels appeals his conviction, reasserting the Second Amendment challenge that he raised before trial. As with all constitutional questions, we consider the issue de novo. The Second Amendment protects the right of individuals to keep and bear firearms for their self-defense. But even fundamental rights have limits. Before Bruin, our circuit court evaluated the legality of gun restrictions using the familiar standards of scrutiny. 
If legislation infringed on the historical right to bear arms, we asked whether the government had a sufficiently strong interest and whether its firearm regulation was sufficiently tailored. If a law breached the core of the Second Amendment liberty, we applied strict scrutiny. If not, we applied intermediate scrutiny. Bruin decisively rejected that kind of analysis. In place of means and balancing, Bruin requires us to interpret the Second Amendment in light of its original public meaning. As the court explained, the Second Amendment codified a pre-existing right with pre-existing limits. To ascertain those limits, history is our heuristic. Because historical gun regulations evince the kind of limits that were well understood at the time the Second Amendment was ratified, a regulation that is inconsistent with those limits is inconsistent with the Second Amendment. To determine whether a modern firearms law is unconstitutional, we now proceed in two steps. First, we ask whether the Second Amendment applies by its terms. When the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. Second, we ask whether a given gun restriction is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. The government bears the burden of demonstrating a tradition supporting the challenged law. Only by showing that the law does not tread on the historical scope of the right can the government justify its regulation. The second step requires both close attention to history and analogical reasoning. Bruin did not forswear all legislative innovation. To the contrary, the Constitution can and must apply to circumstances beyond those the founders specifically anticipated. What we are looking for is a tradition. Well-accepted limits on the right to bear arms manifested by a tangible practice of comparable gun regulations. But how do we know whether an older regulatory practice is comparable? Bruin helpfully gave us two conceptual pathways. If the modern regulation addresses a general societal problem that has persisted since the 18th century, then the lack of a distinctly similar historical regulation addressing that problem is relevant evidence that the challenged regulation is inconsistent with the Second Amendment. But if a modern law addresses unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes, it calls for a more nuanced approach. We must reason by analogy to determine whether older regulations are relevantly similar to the modern law. Bruin acknowledged the difficulty of determining whether two laws are relevantly similar. Bruin clarified that two laws are relevantly similar if they share a common why and how. They must both address a comparable problem, the why, and place a comparable burden on the right holder, the how. In all of that, Bruin reminded us that we are looking for a representative historical analog not a historical twin. It is not a death knell to the government that the challenge regulation did not previously exist. What matters is whether a conceptual fit exists between the old law and the new. Deciding whether there is a match between historical and modern regulations requires the exercise of both analogical reasoning and sound judgment. Nevertheless, we hew closely to Bruin's own reasoning and hold the government to its heavy burden. We begin with the threshold question, whether the Second Amendment even applies to Daniels. The right to bear arms is held by the people. That phrase unambiguously refers to all members of the political community, not an unspecified subset. See Heller. Indeed, the Bill of Rights uses the phrase the people five times. In each place, it refers to all members of our political community, not a special group of upright citizens. Based on that consistent usage, Heller concluded that the Second Amendment right is exercised individually and belongs to all Americans. Even as a marijuana user, Daniels is a member of our political community. Therefore, he has a presumptive right to bear arms. By infringing on that right, 
Section 922G3 contradicts the plain text of the Second Amendment. True, Heller described the Second Amendment as applying to law-abiding, responsible citizens, and Bruin used the phrase law-abiding 14 times, including in the opening sentence, where it says that the Second Amendment protects the right of an ordinary, law-abiding citizen to possess a handgun. The government seizes on that language and insists that the Second Amendment does not extend to Daniels because he is a criminal. But we cannot read too much into the Supreme Court's chosen epithet. More than just model citizens enjoy the right to bear arms. Indeed, the decision of Rahimi held that citizens accused of domestic violence still had Second Amendment rights. It reasoned that when Heller and Bruin used the phrase law-abiding, it was just shorthand to exclude from the discussion the mentally ill and felons, people who were historically stripped of their Second Amendment rights. All others are presumptively included in the Second Amendment's ambit. Because Daniels is not a felon or mentally ill, Rahimi's treatment of the law-abiding moniker suggests that he has presumptive Second Amendment rights as well. Still, Heller's and Bruin's emphasis on law-abiding citizens hints that Congress and state legislatures have greater latitude to limit the gun liberties of the lawless. But as a general rule, limitations on the Second Amendment come from the traditionally understood restrictions on the right to bear arms, not because ordinary citizens are categorically excluded from the privilege. Once we conclude that Daniels has presumptive Second Amendment rights, the focus shifts to step two of the Bruin analysis, whether history and tradition support Section 922 G3. Before we decide whether Section 922 G3 is consistent with our tradition of gun regulation, we must first ask a methodological question. What kind of similarity are we looking for? Distinct similarity or a less precise relevant similarity? That depends on whether Section 922 G3 addresses a general societal problem that has persisted since the 18th century or an unprecedented societal concern that the founding generation did not experience. Bruin does not require more than relevant similarity here. It is true that the founding generation was familiar with intoxication via alcohol and it was familiar with marijuana plants. But the founders grew hemp to make rope. They were not familiar with widespread use of marijuana as a narcotic, nor the modern drug trade. Thus, though intoxication generally was a persistent social problem, the founding generation had no occasion to consider the relationship between firearms and intoxication via cannabis. Although marijuana might be comparable in some ways to alcohol or tobacco, Merely by making the comparison, we have moved past the hunt for a distinctly similar law and are engaged in analogical reasoning. Indeed, Bruin's discussion of distinct and relevant similarity seems aimed at interpreting historical silence. That is, when the historical record reveals no regulations of a particular kind, we could interpret that silence in one of two ways. We could say that it means nothing, neither approval nor disapproval, or we could count silence as evidence that the public did not approve of such a regulation. Bruin says we should make the latter inference, at least when the public experienced the harm the modern-day regulation attempts to address. By contrast, when the ratifying public did not confront a particular harm, its failure to regulate it says little about whether it approved such regulation. In that case, we look instead for analogs, similar harms that the founding generation did confront and the regulations they used to address them. Just as founding-era prohibitions on firearms in sensitive places can extend to new and analogous sensitive places, we can compare the founders' treatment of one problem to new problems that the founders could not have anticipated. Even so, the government has the burden to find and explicate the historical sources that support the constitutionality of Section 922 G3. Here, the government's proffered analogs fall into three general buckets. One, statutes disarming intoxicated individuals. Two, 
statutes disarming the mentally ill or insane, and three, statutes disarming those adjudged dangerous or disloyal. Each deserves independent consideration. Because there was little regulation of drugs, related to guns or otherwise, until the late 19th century, intoxication via alcohol is the next closest comparator. Throughout the colonial period and into the 19th century, Americans drank alcohol, and lots of it. Common sense indicates that individuals who are impaired by alcohol lack the self-restraint to handle deadly weapons safely. So it is unsurprising to find historical laws dealing with guns and alcohol. Such rules are relevant to our history and tradition of gun regulation. Unfortunately for the government, that regulatory tradition is sparse and limited during the relevant time periods. Despite the prevalence of alcohol and alcohol abuse, neither the government nor amici identify any restrictions at the founding that approximate Section 922 G3. Although a few states after the Civil War prohibited carrying weapons while under the influence, none barred gun possession by regular drinkers. Founding-era statutes concerning guns and alcohol were few. They were also limited in scope and duration. The laws that did exist had two primary concerns. One, the misuse of weapons while intoxicated, and two, the discipline of state militias. Consider the first group of statutes. In 1656, Virginia banned shooting any guns at drinking. But in historical context, that was not a disarming regulation like Section 922 G3. Virginia was a brand new colony at the time. The 1656 statute was explicitly passed to conserve gunpowder, which was at a premium, and because ill-timed gunshots might be mistaken for a signal that local Indians were attacking. Not only was the statute enacted for a different purpose, but it did not even ban gun possession or carry. It only prevented the colonists from misusing the guns they did have during bouts of drinking. Another law, passed by New York in 1771, prohibited citizens from firing guns from December 31st to January 2nd because of the great damages done by those intoxicated with liquor during New Year celebrations. The statute had a similar purpose, as Section 922.3 does, preventing public harm by individuals under the influence. Nevertheless, the law was strikingly narrow. It applied on only three days out of the year. It only prevented firing guns, not possessing them, and it applied only to those under the influence, not habitual drinkers. Beyond that duet of colonial regulations, separated by over a century, the government identifies no founding-era law or practice of disarming ordinary citizens for drunkenness even if that intoxication was routine. Instead, the government points to a second group of statutes regulating militia service. For example, a soldier could be disarmed if he showed up for military service in New Jersey disguised in liquor. Pennsylvania did the same in 1780. For related reasons, dram shops were prohibited from selling to local soldiers. Those laws, however, are even less probative. For one thing, their purpose is different. They exist to ensure a competent military. A service member cannot perform his duties if he is impaired. Furthermore, the limitations applied only to the militia. None of the laws spoke to the ability of militiamen to carry outside of their military service. At the founding, as today... Restrictions on the liberties of servicemen tell us little about the limits acceptable for the general public. Given the prevalence of drinking at the founding, that handful of laws puts the government on shaky footing. The government has failed to identify any relevant tradition at the founding of disarming ordinary citizens who consumed alcohol. The government's Reconstruction-era evidence, though stronger, still falls short of the history and tradition that could validate Section 922 G3. Between 1868 and 1883, three states prohibited carrying firearms while intoxicated, Kansas, Missouri, and Wisconsin. 
Missouri's law was challenged under the state constitution, but was upheld by the Missouri Supreme Court in 1886. The opinion acknowledged that the state constitution secured to the citizen the right to bear arms in the defense of his home, person, and property, but the court reasoned that if the state could regulate the manner in which arms may be borne, there is no good reason why the legislature may not do the same thing with reference to the condition of the person who carries such weapons. The ban on intoxicated carry was therefore in perfect harmony with the Constitution. Those laws come closer to supporting Section 922G3, but they are notably few. The Bruin Court doubted that three colonial-era laws could suffice to show a tradition, let alone three laws passed 80 to 90 years after the Second Amendment was ratified. More fatally, Section 922G3 is substantially broader than the post-bellum intoxication laws. On Bruin's two axes of relevant similarity, the post-bellum laws and Section 922G3 share a common why, preventing public harm by individuals who lack self-control and carry deadly weapons. But the how is different. At most, the post-bellum statutes support the banning the carry of firearms while under the influence. Section 922G3 bans all possession, and it does so for an undefined set of users, even if they are not under the influence. As applied to Daniels, Section 922G3 is a significantly greater restriction of his rights than were any of the 19th century laws. Although the older laws bans on carry are likely analogous to Section 922G3's ban on possession, there is a considerable difference between someone who is actively intoxicating and someone who is an unlawful user under Section 922G3. The statutory term unlawful user captures regular users of marijuana, but its temporal nexus is vague. It does not specify how recently an individual must use drugs to qualify for the prohibition. Daniels himself admitted to smoking marijuana 14 days a month, but we do not know how much he used at those times, and the government presented no evidence that Daniels was intoxicated at the time he was found with a gun. Indeed, under the government's reasoning, Congress could ban gun possession by anyone who has multiple alcoholic drinks a week from possessing guns based on the postbellum intoxicated carry laws. The analogical reasoning Bruin prescribed cannot stretch that far. A further problem with the Reconstruction Era statutes is precisely that they emerged during and after Reconstruction. Bruin did not discount the relevance of late 19th century history, but it insisted that the Second Amendment's meaning is fixed according to the understanding of those who ratified it. A tradition cannot inform the original meaning of the Bill of Rights if it emerges 100 years later. When 19th century practice is inconsistent with the categorical protection of the Second Amendment, the text controls. Admittedly, there is an ongoing scholarly debate about whether the right to bear arms acquired new meaning in 1868 when it was incorporated against the states. But the instant case involves a federal statute and therefore implicates the Second Amendment, not the 14th. Even if the public understanding of the right to bear arms did evolve, it cannot change the meaning of the Second Amendment, which was fixed when it first applied to the federal government in 1791. And even if late-century practice shed some dim light on founding-era understandings, the most of Reconstruction-era regulation support is a ban on gun possession while an individual is presently under the influence. By regulating citizens like Daniels based on a pattern of drug use, Section 922G3 goes further. Our history and tradition do not support the leap. As an alternative, the government posits that the tradition of disarming the mentally ill supports Section 922G3. To quote Heller's now famous caveat, long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by the mentally ill are still presumptively lawful. Obviously, mental illness and drug use are not the same thing. 
But there is an intuitive similarity. Those who are briefly mentally infirm as a result of intoxication are similar to those permanently mentally infirm because of illness or disability. We note at the outset that there is not a clear set of positive law statutes concerning mental illness and firearms. In fact, the federal ban on gun possession by those judged mentally ill was enacted in 1868, the same year as Section 922 G3. But scholars have suggested that the tradition was implicit at the founding, because in 18th century America, justices of the peace were authorized to lock up lunatics who were dangerous to be permitted to go abroad. In other words, the greater restriction included the lesser. If the insane person could be wholly deprived of their liberty and property, the government could necessarily take away their firearms. Of course, the practice of institutionalizing so-called lunatics does not give clear guidance about which lesser impairments are serious enough to warrant the loss of constitutional freedoms. But we can assume that intoxication with marijuana is analogous to short-term mental illness. Dr. Benjamin Rush who signed the Declaration of Independence, said a temporary fit of madness was a symptom of drunkenness. And in an influential treatise on constitutional law, Thomas Cooley described drunkenness as a form of temporary insanity. The same could be said of intoxication via marijuana. Still, that comparison could justify disarming a citizen only while he is in a state comparable to lunacy. Just as there was no historical justification for disarming a citizen of sound mind, there is no tradition that supports disarming a sober citizen who is not currently under an impairing influence. Indeed, it is helpful to compare the tradition surrounding the insane and the tradition surrounding the intoxicated side by side. The founders purportedly institutionalized the insane and stripped them of their guns, but they allowed alcoholics to possess firearms while sober. We must ask, in Bruin-style analogical reasoning, which is Daniels more like? A categorically insane person or a repeat alcohol user? Given his periodic marijuana usage, Daniels is firmly in the latter camp. If and when Daniels uses marijuana, he may be comparable to a mentally ill individual whom the founders would have disarmed. But while sober, he is like the repeat alcohol user in between periods of drunkenness. In short, neither the restrictions on the mentally ill nor the regulatory tradition surrounding intoxication can justify Daniel's conviction. Perhaps the government can show that the drugs Daniel's used were so powerful that anyone who uses them is permanently impaired in a way that's comparable to ongoing mental illness. Or the government could demonstrate that Daniel's drug use was so regular and so heavy that he was continually impaired. Here, it has shown evidence of neither. Finally, the government asserts that Congress can limit gun possession by those dangerous to the public peace or safety. It contends that principle was well understood when the Second Amendment was ratified, and it posits that Daniel's, a repeat marijuana user, was presumptively dangerous enough to be disarmed. Although there is some historical evidence for the government's underlying principle, the historical examples of danger-based disarmament do not justify Section 922G3's application here. As Justice Barrett detailed when she was a judge on the Seventh Circuit, history supports the intuitive proposition that the government can keep deadly firearms away from dangerous people. Even the amici, who believe that Daniels should prevail on a Second Amendment challenge, suggest that the government can disarm the dangerous, even under Bruin's history and tradition test. That said, no one piece of historical evidence suggests that when the founders ratified the Second Amendment, they authorized Congress to disarm anyone it deemed dangerous. Instead, the government collects different statutes disarming discrete classes of persons at various points in history. Those laws suggest an abstract belief that an individual's right to bear arms could be curtailed if he was legitimately dangerous to the public. The government's examples fall into two general buckets. First, states barred political dissidents from owning guns during periods of conflict. 
Many American states, for instance, disarm those who fail to take an oath of allegiance during the Revolutionary War. Second, both British and American governments disarmed religious minorities, especially Catholics. Each of those laws was generally based on concerns with the safety of the polity, but each disarmament also had its own unique political or social motivations. Almost all the laws disarming dissidents were passed during wartime or periods of unprecedented political turmoil. Indeed, founding-era governments did not disarm loyalists because they were thought to lack self-control. It was because both were viewed as potential threats to the integrity of the state. The same was true of religious minorities. The perceived threat was as much political as it was religious. Independent of those class-based restrictions, the government relies heavily on the Militia Act of 1662, which allowed the crown to disarm those whom he judged dangerous to the peace of the kingdom. That is the most direct support for the government's principle that the legislature could prophylactically disarm any citizen who could potentially be dangerous. But Rahimi held that the Militia Act was not incorporated into American law. After all, the act was the justification for the widespread disarming of political opponents by Charles II and James II. After the Glorious Revolution, the 1689 English Bill of Rights expanded the right to bear arms in order to curtail the Militia's Act's reach and limit the Crown's politically motivated disarmaments. Our Second Amendment is a direct descendant of that latter guarantee. If anything, our constitutional right to bear arms was purposefully broader than its English ancestor. Although some historians maintain that the Militia Act was still frequently used after the Glorious Revolution, its limitations likely did not survive the categorical command of the Second Amendment. Finally, the government posits that Congress can disarm dangerous citizens because the idea was discussed during the ratification of the Constitution. Samuel Adams, for example, proposed an amendment at the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention that would have limited the right to bear arms to peaceable citizens. At the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, the dissenting minority suggested several constitutional amendments, including one that would have protected the right to bear arms unless for crimes committed or real danger of public injury from individuals. Heller described the Pennsylvania proposal as an influential precursor to our Second Amendment, as many of the Pennsylvania minority suggestions ended up in our current Bill of Rights. Again, however, we must pause. The predecessors of the Second Amendment gave concrete language to possible limits on the right to bear arms, Yet, that language was not adopted. Instead, the people ratified the unqualified directive, shall not be infringed. Usually, when the relevant lawmaking body does not adopt language in a draft, we presume that the stricken language was not intended. Indeed, Rahimi also considered those Second Amendment precursors and concluded that the unadopted language could not supplant the amendments enacted text. That said, there is an undeniable through line in all those historical sources. Founding era governments took guns away from persons perceived to be dangerous. Even if the disarming of loyalists and Catholics was limited to exigent historical context, no party identifies disputes regarding the lawfulness of such prohibitions at the time. Indeed, some states, such as Pennsylvania, disarmed dissident citizens while their state constitution guaranteed a right to bear arms. And even though the founders repudiated the Militia Act and rejected the Second Amendment precursors, the language of those documents says something about the outer limit of the right to bear arms in the English tradition. Perhaps the Second Amendment was meant to do away with all those restrictions of liberty, and we can chalk such restrictions up to reactionary excess during the birth of a nation. On the other hand, we cannot completely discount the sheer number of disarming statutes at the time of the founding. Together, they suggest a public understanding that when a class of individuals was thought to pose a grave danger to public peace, it could be disarmed. Assuming the Second Amendment encodes some government power to disarm the dangerous, the question becomes, at what level of generality may we implement that principle? 
Bruin requires us to interrogate the historical records for relevantly similar regulations. It does not allow us to enforce unenacted policy goals lurking behind the Second Amendment. Indeed, any ability to implement a dangerousness principle is fenced in by at least two strictures in the applicable case law. On the one hand, the legislature cannot have unchecked power to designate a group of persons as dangerous and thereby disarm them. Congress could claim that immigrants, the indigent, or the politically unpopular were presumptively dangerous and eliminate their Second Amendment rights without judicial review. That would have no true limiting principle and would render the Second Amendment a dead letter. On the other hand, we cannot inspect a legislature's judgment of dangerousness using traditional standards of scrutiny. Bruin forbids us from balancing a law's justifications against the burden it places on right holders. Imagine, for example, that a state legislature disarms all men, citing statistics that men commit more violent crimes than do women. Before Bruin, we would have considered whether the evidence supporting male dangerousness was substantial enough and whether the law was sufficiently tailored to justify such a categorical restriction on gun rights. But Bruin forswears that kind of review. Similarly, imagine that the government bars all convicted cyber criminals from owning guns, referencing the dangerousness of cyber crime. Cyber crime is assuredly dangerous, but in a different way than is violent crime. Applying a standard of scrutiny, we might have interrogated whether Congress had adequately demonstrated that someone who spreads ransomware or pirates television shows is likely to be dangerous with a firearm. Again, Bruin heads that analysis off at the pass. How then do we square the post-Bruin circle? To remain faithful to Bruin, the solution is to analogize to particular regulatory traditions instead of a general notion of dangerousness. The government must show that a historical danger-based disarmament is analogous to the challenged regulation. We must use Bruin's why and how analysis to assess whether the founding era restriction is relevantly similar to the modern one. We must ask, why was the group considered dangerous at the founding and therefore disarmed? And why does the modern law classify a person as presumptively dangerous? Is the comparison supported by the record? Furthermore, how did the historical regulation limit the rights of the dangerous class? And how does the modern regulation do so? Applying Bruin's framework to the proffered analogs, it follows that the government's theory of danger-based disarmament falls apart. The government identifies no class of persons at the founding or even at Reconstruction who were dangerous for reasons comparable to marijuana users. Marijuana users are not a class of political traitors, as British loyalists were perceived to be, nor are they like Catholics and other religious dissidents who were seen as potential insurrectionists. And even if we consider the racially discriminatory laws at the founding, Daniels is not like the minorities who the founders thought threatened violent revolt. The government suggests that in the spirit of the drafts of the Second Amendment and the Militia Act, marijuana users threaten the public peace. But at the time of the founding, that notion referred specifically to violence or rebellion, not generalized public harm. And Section 922G3 is not limited to those with a history of violent behavior. Not all members of the set of drug users are violent. As applied in this case, the government has not shown how Daniel's marijuana use predisposes him to armed conflict or that he has a history of drug-related violence. Furthermore, even as the founders were disarming Catholics and politically disaffected citizens, they left ordinary drunkards unregulated. The government has no meaningful response to the fact that neither Congress nor the state disarmed alcoholics, the group most closely analogous to marijuana users in the 18th and 19th centuries. As with the government's analogy to mental illness, we must ask, which are marijuana users more like, British loyalists during the revolution or repeat alcohol users? The answer is surely the latter. The government asks us to set aside the particulars of the historical record and defer to Congress's modern-day judgment that Daniels is presumptively dangerous because he smokes marijuana multiple times a month. 
But that is the kind of toothless, rational basis review that Bruin prescribes. Absent a comparable regulatory tradition in either the 18th or 19th century, Section 922 G3 fails constitutional muster under the Second Amendment. Daniel's Section 922 G3 conviction is inconsistent with our history and tradition of gun regulation. We conclude only by emphasizing the narrowness of that holding. We do not invalidate the statute in all its applications, but importantly, only as applied to Daniel's. Nor do we suggest that a robust Second Amendment is incompatible with other reasonable gun regulations. Such statutes just need to be consonant with the limits the founding generation understood to be permissible when they ratified the Second Amendment. The Congress has failed to demonstrate that here. The judgment of conviction is therefore reversed, and the judgment dismissing the indictment is rendered. And now a written concurrence by Judge Stephen A. Higginson. In the 15 years since the Supreme Court first found in the Second Amendment an individual right to keep and bear arms to defend the home, see District of Columbia v. Heller and McDonald v. City of Chicago, Historians and legal scholars have continued to question this interpretation, while the nation has continued to look for constitutionally permissible safeguards against gun violence and gun-related death rates that outstrip those of almost every other nation. Faced with this expanded Second Amendment reach and the corresponding wave of legal challenges to gun safety regulations, lower courts eventually coalesced around a two-step framework for analyzing Second Amendment challenges that combined history with means and scrutiny. In applying this framework, courts were attempting to balance Heller's rejection on originalist grounds of the previously narrow focus on a militia interest in favor of an interest in self-defense, with Heller's recognition that the Second Amendment contains limiting principles and exceptions. Specifically, Heller acknowledged that the Second Amendment does not curtail the legislative power to regulate and restrict the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons, nor does it undermine long-standing prohibitions on the carrying of firearms in sensitive places or by certain persons or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Thus, even as the politics of gun safety remained hotly contested, the law had somewhat settled, and under this framework, courts generally permitted Americans, through both state and federal elected officials, to enact, or opt not to enact, gun safety regulations to address the ongoing crisis of gun violence. Last year, however, the Supreme Court again revised Second Amendment doctrine in Bruin, declaring that this two-step approach, which combined attentiveness to history with a traditional judicial balancing test, was one step too many. Now the court has written, if the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, then a gun regulation is presumptively unlawful unless the government can justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Bound by this interpretive sequence, we hold today that 18 U.S.C. Section 922 G3, a decades-old felony provision of our federal firearms law, is unconstitutional as applied to Mr. Daniels. Although our decision is limited in scope, it is hard for me to avoid the conclusion that most, if not all, applications of Section 922 G3 will likewise be deficient. It is also important to acknowledge that other gun safety laws, especially long-standing status-based prohibitions previously understood to be constitutionally unassailable, have been recently struck down by courts across the country as they attempt to faithfully implement Bruin. To be clear, I fully concur in the majority's reasoning, albeit with the caveat that the Supreme Court has granted certiorari in United States v. Rahimi. As I believe that we have applied Bruin as well as possible in evaluating the constitutionality of Section 922 G3, I write separately to highlight what has become increasingly apparent, that courts operating in good faith are struggling at every stage of the Bruin inquiry. Those struggles encompass numerous, often dispositive, difficult questions, including but not limited to the following. 
First, who and what conduct is covered by the Second Amendment? Second, how does the government demonstrate a regulatory tradition? This inquiry implicates questions about how many states must have historically addressed an issue, or how many laws must have been passed, or some combination of the two, for a historical practice to constitute a tradition, as well as a related issue of enforcement. Third, what is the operative time period for such regulations, 1791 or 1868? And to what extent does post-ratification practice count? Fourth, but again, this list is not exhaustive, how are courts to differentiate between general societal problems that have persisted since the 18th century and those that implicate unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes, and moreover, between historical analogs as distinction from historical twins? More foundationally, courts are laboring to give meaning to the Bruin requirement of historical inquiry. Must the government provide expert testimony to prevail, or could a district court independently seek such evidence? And in the event such evidence is lacking in the record below, may the Court of Appeals collect their own history and make up for a party's earlier failing? Going even further, should courts undertake discovery and evidentiary testing of historical evidence to perceive the existence of a sufficient regulatory tradition? And in making that conclusion, does the constitutionality of any given provision rise or fall with the strength of the historical record as to a specific case, or will rulings be treated as establishing a single historical truth? The majority in Bruin, responding to unworkability concerns identified by the dissent and echoed by courts over the past year, may have intimated answers. Specifically, the majority insisted that, as in other legal disputes, historical evidence is predicated on our adversarial system of adjudication, in which courts must decide the case based on the historical record compiled by the parties. In my view, this suggests that Bruin requires that an evidentiary inquiry first be conducted in courts of original jurisdiction, subject to party presentation principles, aided by discovery and cross-examination, and with authority to solicit expert opinion. In granting certiorari in Rahimi, the Supreme Court likely will resolve some of these questions. Of course, in the meantime, it is our job as an inferior court to apply the Supreme Court's mandates and aid the development of this field of law. But the uncertainty and upheaval resulting from best efforts to apply Bruin now extend far beyond our dockets. Myriad and obvious public safety laws, some over a century old, face inconsistent invalidation. The impact of these challenges, outside of the evident yet indescribable tragedies of victims of gun violence, will fall heavily on states which exercise most police power and must assure public safety. Already, as courts work through the impact of Bruin, defendants guilty of a gun crime in one jurisdiction are presently innocent of it in another. In attempting to navigate this new landscape, it is prudent to first return to the text of the Second Amendment, which states in full, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Just as the doctrine corrected in Heller was held to have overemphasized the first third of the text, a well-regulated militia, it is possible that inferior judicial officers such as myself are misinterpreting Bruin by pressing too much on the last, the right to keep and bear arms. It may be that the Supreme Court will remind us of the Second Amendment's middle, where the framers stated explicitly that they were fashioning a right necessary to the security of a free state. In this sense, unlike the textually unbounded pledges assuring freedom of speech and conscience, the right of the people to keep and bear arms is less about the antithesis of liberty and control and is more designed to assure domestic tranquility and the general welfare. Put another way, the Second Amendment is not only a right to have, but is especially a right to have to protect the state. That right to protect as both Heller, MacDonald, and Bruin affirmatively acknowledged, incorporate significant public safety exceptions. 
Importantly, the Supreme Court in Bruin saw itself as continuing with, rather than breaking from, Heller, which recognized that, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. Thus, although in dicta, the Heller majority was confident that, though never conceived of by the framers and hence never subject to public safety regulation, certain dangerous and unusual weapons could properly be banned. Similarly, the majority assured that nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on some of the most critical tools for combating gun violence, including both people and place-based restrictions. These assurances are a recognition that the Second Amendment explicitly, and unlike the other original Ten Amendments in our Bill of Rights, ties to the security of our country. The Second Amendment assures a vigilant, armed citizenry, and it did so for an explicit purpose, that is, being necessary to the security of a free state. To read the Second Amendment as providing an ever-expanding individual right, without limits, therefore, runs counter to both its text and the framers' own understanding. As should be evident, I am appreciative that the court that speaks the final word has agreed to provide more guidance on an issue of such national importance. I cannot help but fear, absent some reconciliation of the Second Amendment's several values, any further reductionism of Bruin will mean systematic, albeit inconsistent, judicial dismantling of the laws that have served to protect our country for generations." Furthermore, such decisions will constrain the ability of our state and federal political branches to address gun violence across the country, which every day cuts short the lives of our citizens. This state of affairs will be nothing less than a Second Amendment caricature, a right turned inside out against freedom and security in our state. And that's it, folks. That is the 3-0 decision in United States of America versus Patrick Darnell Daniels, a habitual marijuana user who is found guilty of a federal felony under federal statute 18 U.S.C. section 922 G3, making it unlawful for a unlawful user of drugs to be in possession of a firearm. This decision out of the Fifth Circuit reverses the conviction of Patrick Daniels, eliminates the indictment against him on this criminal charge of being an unlawful user of drugs and possession of a firearm, and finds the application of Section 922G3 to Mr. Daniels to be unconstitutional. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that reading of U.S. v. Daniels, the Second Amendment slash marijuana decision out of the Fifth Circuit, handed down August 9th, 2023. I certainly enjoyed reading it for you. Before we go, I just want to remind you that if you like this kind of content, much of the content we produce each week is limited exclusively to our Law of Self-Defense members. You can try out Law of Self-Defense membership for just 99 cents for two weeks, unlimited access to our members-only content. And if you decide to stay a member after the two weeks, it's still dirt cheap. It's only about 30 cents a day, less than $10 a month to be a Law of Self-Defense member and get much, much more of this kind of use of force law, insight, analysis, education, including increasing coverage of Second Amendment issues. You can take advantage of that two-week trial offer at lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. For just 99 cents, folks, lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. Until next time, remember, if you carry a gun, if you carry a knife, if you carry pepper spray, if you practice BJJ so that you're hard to kill, that's why I do all those things so that I'm hard to kill, my family is hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Until we meet again, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.